Good afternoon, everyone. Major apologies for being a half hour late. Um, I can make it up for you by having nothing to start with and going straight to Matt's <laughs> questions. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't inflict. Not only nothing to start with, but nothing to say. I won't, I won't inflict any. I have plenty to say, but I will not inflict any opening <laughs> comments on you. All right. Can I just start with something which I think you're going to dispatch with pretty quickly? But uh, this guy who's been charged in the um, uh, the apparent assassination attempt of uh, former <laughs> President Trump over the weekend. Did he uh, ever come to the State Department's attention um, while he, when either when he was in Kiev uh, advocating on behalf of uh, both the Ukraine and on uh, behalf of Afghan uh, Afghan citizens? And when I say come to attention, did he register with the embassy while he was there, as you know, you ask or suggest that people should do, or was he did did people bring him to your attention? Uh, or did he have any, did he make any contact with embassy officials? Yeah, I will, um, I'll have to go back and check the answer, whether he registered, whether he had any contact with the embassy officials. Uh, I'm not aware either, uh, in, in either case. Um, obviously, we do ask people to register. Uh, sometimes embassies are aware of people um, traveling inside a country, especially if those people are doing media interviews and otherwise being high profile, even if they don't register um, with the department, but I'll have to go back and check and see. So you don't, you don't know the answer to I, I don't. I can check. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Are you going to love them? Sure. Um, well, I mean, just to begin with, in general, what what does the U.S. know uh, about what happened? Uh, there have been a series of deaths and injuries, apparently, from exploding pagers. Um, is it, was the U.S. The U.S. have any knowledge? Uh, what does it know now, and, and when did it know about what is happening? So we are gathering information on this incident. Uh, I can tell you that the U.S. was not involved in it. Um, the U.S. was not aware uh, of this incident in advance, and at this point, we're gathering information. Uh, and what information have we gathered so far? Uh, we'll continue to collect information. I don't have any any public readout to give now, but uh, we're collecting information um, uh, in the same way that journalists are across the world um, to uh, gather the facts about what might have happened. Uh, obviously, it doesn't take much uh, guesswork who the most likely culprit would be in terms of, uh, of doing this, in terms of who the enemy of Hezbollah is. Uh, do you have any indications that to, to doubt that it would be Israel that was behind the... I don't have any assessment to offer one way or, uh, or other at this point. And I know you're saying that, but in terms of what this means, I mean, there's been uh, for a number of weeks the talk of, uh, of, uh, of, of dialing down, or at least not having an, a retaliation from Iran over, you know, sort of a, a tit for tat, if you will. Uh, how does this play into it? Is there any message that you're sending to Israel in terms of what to do next, and, or for that matter, to Iran, to Hezbollah, in terms of how to respond to it? So I never want to either comment or, or speculate about the impact of any one incident, uh, especially in the early stages of an incident. Um, and I'm not going to do so here. That's been our consistent policy to, to try and avoid doing. I will say that our overall policy remains consistent, which is um, we do want to see a diplomatic resolution to the conflict between Israel uh, and Hezbollah. We want to see one that um, allows the tens of thousands of Israelis who've been displaced from their homes and the tens of thousands of Lebanese who have been displaced from their homes to be able to re return home. And that's what we uh, are continuing to pursue. I'll let others take it. Yeah, Mayor. Just a couple of follow-ups on that, Matt. So um, how concerned are you about escalation now after this attack? So again, I don't want to draw any specific conclusions about this incident yet or speculate about what may, might happen from them. I will say that, of course, since October 7th, we have seen any number of uh, incidents uh, that have led to uh, the heightened risk of escalation that has been uh, a feature of the conflict across the blue line since October 7th. And so we are always concerned about escalation. We are always concerned about any type of event that may cause further escalation. And it remains our, our, our message to both Israel uh, uh, and to other parties that they needed to do everything they can to try and reach a diplomatic resolution. That said, we go back to the fundamental, I know people get tired of hearing me say this, we go back to the fundamental issue we face here, which is very, very difficult to get a diplomatic resolution in the North absent uh, a resolution to the conflict in Gaza, absent a ceasefire in Gaza, which is why we continue to push for that ceasefire, because we think it'll um, help make it uh, much easier to reach a resolution. So how do you see this incident's impact the Gaza ceasefire talks then? I think, it's, I, I, I think it's too early to say, look, this is an incident that just occurred in the past few hours. Um, we're continuing to gather information about it. I wouldn't want to, make, I wouldn't want to speculate or make any predictions about okay, a, what a, might a, happen. A couple of other a couple of things more. Um, Hezbollah has 
accused Israel um, of sort of launching this attack. You said you were gathering information. Is there anything in that information that that would lead you to sort of reject that accusation? I just don't want to uh, offer any type of assessment uh, on this incident one way or the other at this point. Are you trying to make an assessment, though? Like, in your gathering of information, are you going to be able to offer an assessment tomorrow or the next day? Or is the United States going to be completely, like, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not going to. We offer. are continuing to gather information. Uh, and when we have something to say about it, we will certainly say it, but one, not, not before then. OK, one final thing. Um, Regardless of it, if this incident, although it's a little bit hard to sort of leave that aside right now, but over the past couple of days, we have heard uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu especially uh, talk about the how unsustainable it is in, in North, um, in the border. And last night, the cabinet basically uh, said military action would be needed for to allow thousands of residents to go back to their homes. They've effectively expanded the objectives of the war. So is the, is, does the United States see military action from Israel more likely in light of that? So we agree that it is unsustainable for tens of thousands of Israeli families to be displaced from their homes, just as it is unsustainable for tens of thousands of Lebanese families to be displaced from their homes. All of them need to be able to return home. So then you take, uh, you go to the question of what's the best way to achieve them being able to return to your, their homes. And it is our judgment that a diplomatic solution is the best way to, uh, to get them back to their homes. Because if you look at what a military conflict would entail, it's hard to see how that gets the, uh, those families on either side of their border back to their homes quickly. Um, so that's why we continue to push, um, uh, both side, we continue to push for a diplomatic, re diplomatic resolution of this conflict. Yes. Follow up. Yeah. Can I follow, Go ahead. Can I follow up that? Um, you say you're gathering information. How are you gathering that information? Do you expect to have an independent U.S. assessment to follow on Humera's question? Uh, so I don't want to prejudge what we'll say in the days uh, to come. I can tell you what we're doing right now is gathering information through all of the ways in which we usually gather information. And have you been in touch with any Lebanese or Israeli officials? In uh, the I, I can't read out every contact that we've had in the last couple of hours. It's only been a couple of hours since this incident happened. But of course, we're gathering uh, information through diplomatic channels as well as other channels uh, about this incident. There are reports that the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon was also injured in this attack incident. Um, are you concerned about Iran taking advantage of this? To so also we've seen those reports. Have I you think seen any, any uh, indications that they first plan of all, to? Apologies for, for yeah. interrupting okay. in the middle of the question. Um, I've seen the reports. I don't want to speak to what the implications might be before a report is confirmed. But certainly, uh, as is always the case, we would urge Iran not to take advantage of any incident, any instability, to try to add further uh, instability and to further increase uh, tensions in the region. That has been our message to Iran uh, since October 7th. Go ahead. Just a quick follow up, and um, you, you offered a line on it, but um, just to make sure it's airtight. So the U.S. was in no way involved in terms of supporting this operation, offering intelligence. In, in no way was the U.S. Correct. Involved. Okay, and no part of the U.S. government, I understand you speak only for this department, but such disclaimers have been offered from state before. You were not given a heads up. We were uh, not aware of this as this incident, no. Okay, on ceasefire talks, um, is the expectation still that a renewed bridging proposal is expected to arrive this week? Uh, so I have not put a timetable on that. Um, I think I was asked about this a number of times yesterday. And I said I'm not going to put a timetable on when we might put forward uh, a further proposal. We are engaged with, uh, we continue to be engaged with uh, the other two mediators in uh, uh, in the conflict, Egypt and Qatar. The secretary uh, is on his way to Egypt right now. We'll be meeting with Egyptian officials uh, about a number of things, but squarely on the agenda is how we get uh, a proposal that we think would secure agreement from both parties. Uh, I don't want to put a timetable on when we would put that proposal forward because ultimately we want a proposal that's going to get to yes. And it's very important that we, uh, as you've heard the secretary say, stop the haggling back and forth. And so we want to, when we present a proposal, we want to know it's going to get to yes. And that's the work that we're doing with uh, our Egyptian and Qatari partners uh, this week. Uh, are the Qatar Rays involved? Because I understand that the secretaries in Cairo specifically speaking on discrete topics with the Egyptians, but are the Qataris and Israelis going to be looped in 
It's part of these discussions? We are, so the, the secretaries in Egypt having bilateral meetings with Egypt, right. but we continue to discuss on a daily basis this process with the Qataris, as well as uh, in a different format with the Israelis. The Israelis are obviously are not a mediator, so we don't have the same types of discussions with them as we do with Egypt and Qatar, but we do continue to have discussions about this with all of those parties. I have one more on Ukraine for later. Yeah, Hibbe, Hibbe, go ahead. Uh, I'll come to you, Sai. I know that you won't we don't want to comment on what's happening, but till now the figures, we don't know the accurate figures of what happened in Lebanon. Some are talking about 3,000s, 4,000s. We have civilians and they're also the Iranian ambassador, also sons of members of parliament from Hezbollah blocks. Do you, I mean, the question, do you think that this is a legitimate target for any party to do that? whether it's Israel or someone else, because there are Hezbollah targets in this, if it's attack or incident or whatever you want to call it. So let me not comment with specific, with respect to this specific incident in answering the question, only because there are a lot of reports out that I, you know, in many cases are not yet confirmed. And as you well know, sometimes in the early hours, uh, reporting, uh, uh, the reporting you see in the early hours tends to be uh, somewhat off the mark. It gets supplemented with additional facts as time goes on. So I will just say um, what we believe are legitimate targets and what are not legitimate targets. Obviously, we, be we believe that civilians are not legitimate targets for any type of operation and that no country should be targeting civilians. No country, nor organization should be targeting civilians. Um, terrorist members of a terrorist organization are legitimate targets um, for uh, countries to launch operations against. And those are the principles that we hold uh, ourselves to, and those are the principles we expect other countries to uphold in their operations. Okay, Matt, and you were also saying that it's hard to achieve a diplomatic solution on the Northern Front with, between Hezbollah and Israel unless we have a ceasefire in Gaza this would be more helpful. Also, Hezbollah is saying the same, but the Israeli wants to change the situation, the current situation. They don't want to go to October 6th. They want to change the current situation, not th the same way it was before October 7th. Do you support that? So what do you mean, in, in what way do you mean they in, want to change the situation? In what way they don't want Hezbollah fighters on the borders? They want a like a buffer zone? I mean, are you able to achieve that? So we, we do want to see Hezbollah fighters withdraw from the border and uh, agree to the parameters of the UN Security uh, Council resolution that was passed some time ago, which they have been in violation of. So we do want to see that. Uh, that is absolutely true and has been our policy for some time. Um, uh, and I would just note that with respect to the re one of the reasons it's so hard to get a diplomatic resolution without uh, calm in Gaza is that's what we've heard the head of Hezbollah say many times. Right? He has made clear that as long as the conflict in Gaza continues, they're going to continue to launch missiles and rockets and drones across the border at Israeli villages, Israeli towns, and so that's what, that is the impediment that we that we face, and we very clearly take a uh, take him at face value given the actions that Hezbollah has shown to be true over the past uh, 11 months. It doesn't change what we have to do and what we're trying to do, and we'll continue to stay focused on. One more question on this, but the Israeli argument is that we cannot, I mean, if we keep the situation as it was on October 6, we are just, we cannot prevent an, another October 7 f from the northern borders. Do you believe this is a, a, an accurate assessment by them? So certainly we want to see a long-term resolution to the security situation that Israel faces in the north of Israel, and we want to see a long-term solution uh, to the insecurity that, that civilians in southern Lebanon have faced. And so you look at this in stages, right? The first thing that we want to get is a ceasefire in Gaza. You've heard me talking about that for the last few minutes because we think that would allow us to unlock a diplomatic resolution uh, uh, across the blue line. We would like to see, as part of that diplomatic resolution, a cessation of, of hostilities. And then ultimately, we would like to see some kind of um, uh, long-term diplomatic resolution, like those that uh, uh, have been reached in the past and at times have broken down. I'm not going to get into the details because those are the things that we would have to, be, to, to negotiate. But it all starts with a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, and that's what we're working on. But the fundamental, to answer your question fundamentally, we don't want to see a situation where Israeli families in northern Israel are living in constant fear of their lives from terrorist attacks. We do want to see uh, that situation change. The question is how you get there, whether you get there through a diplomatic resolution or whether you get there through military action. And we c it continues to be our firm belief 
that the best way to do it is through a diplomatic resolution. Matt, a follow up on this. Uh, I promise I'd, I'd come to the then you, Michelle. Go ahead. Uh, again, I, I, as uh, Heba said, you don't want to talk about it because you don't have the, any assessment yet, US assessment, but things on the ground are moving. Uh, Hezbollah already is accusing Israel of doing the, of, of considering this incident as an attack. The Israelis are putting their relative forces in high alert. There are some reports that Israel will declare soon that the Northern Front is the main front in this war. Do you still believe that your influence is capable of holding this conflict from not exploding into a regional war? Because it seems that it's slipping from the So heads. it is not, I, I understand why you posed the question to me. It's not just a question for the United States. It is a question for every party in the region. Of course, it's a first, uh, it's a first order question to Israel. It's a question to Hezbollah. But it is a question to all of the other countries in the region about what type of region that they want to live in. So the United States is going to continue to push for a diplomatic resolution. We're going to continue to talk to our partners in the region about the need to do any, to avoid any type of steps uh, that would avoid escalation of the conflict. But ultimately, as is always the case, this is a question for parties in the region and what kind of world and what kind of they want to live in and what kind of future that, that they want to have. We continue to believe that the solution to um, uh, the situation in Gaza, the situation across the blue line, the broader instability um, that the region faces is, is to tone down the rhetoric, tone down the tensions, tone down the hostilities, get a ceasefire in Gaza, move to a diplomatic resolution in the north, and set the conditions for broader regional stability. But that requires actions not just by the United States, but by parties in the region who have some agency of their own. But, I mean, you say it's not a question for the United States. No, it's but not just one for us. Yeah, I, 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 get, I know why we get these questions, but the countries and entities in the region have agency, too, uh, for the decisions that they make. And so we will continue to impress upon them what we believe is in their interest and what we believe is in the interest of the region. But these are decisions that countries in the region have to make and uh, entities in the region have to make for but themselves. But don't, don't you see that you are putting your both hands on this conflict and not allowing somebody else to take any actions to pressure Israel. You're not allowing the UN Security Council to put any pressure. Any other countries or international agency in the world who will criticize Israel with an action, you will go against it. So you are actually holding this conflict so, with two hands and not allowing others to act. So first of all, I think the evidence of the past 11 months would very much contradict the idea that we can prevent any country in the world from criticizing Israel because there has been uh, inordinate criticism of Israel. There have been resolutions passed I'm at, the, the action. Uh, say, at, at the at the uh, at the UN. Uh, countries are free to take the steps that they want. And you have seen a number of them across the world uh, uh, do that. As for other countries, look. We are involved in this because we see it as our responsibility as one of the world's powers to try and get involved and reach diplomatic resolutions and try to bring stability. We would welcome other countries' involvement in trying to tone down tensions. We would welcome the involvement of other countries in trying to reach a diplomatic solution either to the conflict in Gaza, as we've seen with Egypt and Qatar, uh, directly engaged as, as mediators, um, or to the situation in the North. There is, in many cases, a paucity of other countries willing to step up and, uh, and take that job. Well, Matt, on this one. So you would welcome Iran? We would certainly welcome Iran stopping funding terrorist organizations that are behind Russia. these attacks and, and behind much of this instability. Look, if Russia, China. if Russia, let me, let me say China, we've been very clear on a, number, let me, a number of times that we would welcome their positive involvement with Russia. Yeah. Russia has this burgeoning security relationship with Iran. If they were to use that influence with Iran to tell them to tone down their, the, their support for terrorism, we would absolutely welcome it. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but okay. we would certainly welcome but taking just those to steps. Make, just to make the point, I mean, they get to play devil's advocate here. When those countries tell you that maybe you should do something by toning down your support for Israel, you say, no, that's, not just, gonna, that's just not going to happen. Look, right? We obviously have a different yeah. assessment of what's yes. productive and what's not. Go uh, going back to, to Lebanon, uh, you said that uh, you consider uh, targeting terrorists as a legitimate uh, act. Then uh, Hezbollah is a terrorist organization by the U.S. 
does that mean that you support such uh, operation that happened today and that targeted Hezbollah? So again, when I gave that answer, I said I want to be very clear that I'm not answering with specific, uh, with any specific specificity regarding this incident because we're continuing to gather facts on it. But in general, yes, of course we support uh, uh, operations to target Hezbollah militants who continue to launch terrorist attacks against civilians. Um, Israel has a right to defend itself against terrorism and a right to carry out legitimate attacks against terrorists, not civilians, but terrorists. So as a general proposition, yes, of course. And one on Iran, Iran president has said today or yesterday, uh, we are brothers with the, with the Americans. They should put an end to their uh, animosity toward us by demonstrating their generosity in deeds. Do you have any comment on that? So certainly we have a uh, uh, great fondness for the Iranian people. There are tremendous connections between the American people uh, and the Iranian people. There is an, uh, a large Iranian di uh, diaspora inside the United States and close family to family ties uh, that we believe are, are incredibly important. Um, but when it comes to the regime, ultimately we'll judge them by their actions, not, not their words. And um, if he wanted to show uh, brotherhood with the United States or with uh, other countries in the world, the way to show brotherhood would not be through rhetoric. It would be um, by s to stop arming and encouraging terrorist groups, uh, to stop nuclear escal uh, escalations and blocking the work of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, it would be to stop plotting to kill political opponents, stop transferring missiles and drones to Russia, and ultimately stop cracking down on the human rights of its own people. Thanks. No, let me go to Heba. Let me go to Heba. Then, uh, yeah. Said, I will. I promise you. Just, Said, well, let me just Said, There's never been, never been a briefing where I've skipped you. So, Heba, go ahead. Just just a follow up. When you are calling on other countries to step up in the region, who do you mean? I mean, I'm not ask you about China and Russia, but other countries. When are you talking for the Lebanese, for example? Who who can step up? So I would, uh, my answer to that would be we would welcome any country that would play a positive role in trying to calm tensions in the region. So every country has different roles that they can play. Obviously, let's we'll give you some examples. Egypt and, and Qatar are playing a direct role in trying to mediate the conflict in Gaza uh, and reach a ceasefire. Other countries at times have been incredibly useful in delivering messages from, um, to Iran that it should refrain from any escalation. And we would encourage any countries in the region or outside the region, for that matter, to play productive roles in trying to de-escalate tensions. Thank you. So, Gita, go ahead. Um, it was past, uh, Michelle, you just said what Iran can do to help the situation. Uh, the Iranian president also said that it was willing to go back, uh, adhere to the JCPOA. Now, uh, are these items that you just, actions that you just mentioned, could those be maybe something that you would expect? expect Iran to do before U.S. would be willing to engage? Uh, so I would say as a, as a matter of first instance, um, before you talk about uh, any sort of nuclear uh, uh, accords, Iran needs to stop blocking the work of the IEA. That's the first thing. They continue to block the work of the IEA, the legitimate work of the IEA. That is the first thing before you can even get into that type of discussion. Said, well, it didn't take too long. I, I want to ask you. What kind of message is Israel sending by doing this attack today while a high-level American envoy doing their to do precisely the opposite of what they did? What kind of message are they sending? Sorry, are they just saying the, 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 well, I, I want to understand yeah. further. I know. I mean, I'm just you know, following up on that, on that point. So because Israel has like a tradition of doing that. I mean, every time there's a high-level American visitor, they either increase settlements or they attack, or they increase their attacks and do things like this. So obviously, they're, they're not really interested in what you're calling for in diplomacy. Isn't that true? So I, I don't have anything to add about this incident than what I said in okay. response to the previous questions. I will say with respect to diplomacy, um, as I said in response to one of the other questions, countries have to make their own decisions. But we continue to believe that a military escalation to this conflict will not achieve Israel's goal of returning the people uh, uh, who have been displaced from their homes to their homes uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. in any no, I mean, I, I just want to, I'm, I'm talking about not the incident itself, but the pattern in which Israel has been, you know, basically well known for, for over many, many years. I mean, we all remember when President Biden was vice president, they, he went there for the first time and they had this, you know, uh, announcement of settlement and so on. There is, you know, sort of a tradition. Okay, so let me go take you back to the legitimacy of targets and so on. Yesterday, uh, a group of settlers attacked a school in Jericho. 
they beat up the students, they broke their bones, they beat up the teachers and so on. Are they a legitimate target? Should they be a legitimate target by the same kind That's of definition that in which you have defined the other targets? Are, are civilians who the settlers are attacking legitimate targets? Absolutely no, not. I'm saying the, not. the settlers who are who have attacked the, the civilians. The settlers should be should the settlers, the settlers be should a legitimate be, target. The settlers should be held accountable through law right. enforcement means. So I'm not asking, through, hold on, not through any type of uh, uh, extrajudicial process um, right. or military process. They should be held account by law enforcement, which is what we would say right. about any type of, of violent attacks on individuals. That the um, uh, law enforcement ought to hold, the, hold them accountable to the full extent of the law. Although they do take the law into their own hand time and time and again, very violent. A absolutely, which is why we believe they should be held accountable. And as you've seen the United States make clear through our own actions, right. if and when Israel does not step up and hold people accountable, we will do so ourselves. I know that you can, you know, you in years past you designated the kind of group as a terrorist organization. Should, you know, armed settlers like this, you know, that you keep sanctioning and so on be also named as terrorist organizations? I'm not going to speak to any type of designations before we would make that uh, any such determination, but we will continue to hold uh, extremist settlers accountable for violent actions. Uh, a couple more questions. Now, uh, yesterday there were a group of uh, UN experts that basically called Israel to be a pariah state. And, you know, they're calling for, of course, a ceasefire and so on. And, uh, you know, because over what they termed as genocide, and my question to you is, you know, back on June 10, there was a UN resolution, which you pushed for, which, you know, you, um, you know, basically made a good case for. 14 people voted for it, or 14 members voted for it in the Security Council. You know, Russia abstained and so on, but the resolution passed. So why not go back and try to implement this resolution? Will the president or will the United States take advantage of this UNGA meeting uh, uh, to basically enforce such resolutions? Uh, we are trying to enforce that resolution, Saeed. The way to enforce that resolution is to reach a ceasefire. If you remember what that resolution called for, it was for a ceasefire uh, right. to, the, to the conflict in Gaza. Right. And the secretary is on his way right. to Egypt right now to try to finalize that ceasefire as one of a number of administration officials who have been working to get that ceasefire over the line uh, uh, in, in the past few weeks. But although, the, you know, it seems that uh, the Israeli prime minister keep moving the goalposts, he keeps moving the goalposts now, including Lebanon, including this and so on, as to the thing. You know, they're the ones that keep changing the terms of the re resolution that Hamas has agreed to, the, so, the, 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 you know, the, the mediators have agreed to and so on. So uh, while I'm not going to negotiate in public, uh, Saeed, I think uh, it, it is well known, it's been well reported, and, and I've uh, uh, spoken to it from here that uh, we have seen Hamas make additional demands okay, and, and uh, uh, through this process. Uh, well. And finally, I know you said that you don't want to, to talk about a timetable as far as the new uh, proposal is concerned and so on. Is it likely to, to occur between now and, you know, the gathering in New York next week? Uh, when I say I don't want to give a timetable, <laughs> right. I mean it. <laughs> I mean, we're talking... I, I, we're, we're no, talking I, I just, when I said, it, we're, when we're I said I'm not going to give a timetable, I'm not going to then come we're and, not talking uh, about and put time. a four we're talking or five-day timetable on I very much mean... We're, we're uh, talking about the venue. Uh, uh, Maybe a, they a, would a, take a, advantage. A, a venue that is time-bound. Uh, so, no, I'm not going to uh, make any predictions. Mike, can we go back to the Secretary's travels? Can you help us understand why he's not going to Israel on this trip, given every other trip to the region? since October 7th he has. So I'm not going to speak to where and uh, will he might, where, where he might uh, fully go, because obviously he's on the trip. And sometimes we do add stops, which is not to say that we will be uh, 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 heading on to Israel. It's not something that he intends to do. Now, uh, he is traveling to Egypt for a couple of specific reasons. One, um, because we want to conduct this strategic dialogue with Egypt, something that we have been planning for some time. We have a number of important bilateral issues with Egypt that we want to discuss in the context of that dialogue. But two, um, there are some issues that we need to engage with the government of Egypt on uh, as it relates to um, this uh, ceasefire proposal that we are trying to um, uh, bring to fruition. So that's why we're moving to, uh, that's why we're in, uh, that's why he's in Egypt. They're one of the mediators. We have some discreet business to do with them when it comes to this proposal. Uh, I think it's important to do. And you didn't see it as important to then go to Israel and continue to try to build political pressure around this deal? The proposal is not ready to present to Israel at this point. So um, uh, it would be premature to to um, be premature to be presenting such a proposal or, or um, uh, uh, doing any other diplomatic engagements around it before we have it ready. 
And then um, one more on the American killed in the West Bank. Has the Israeli government identified which unit in the IDF was responsible for her killing yet? Uh, I, do, I don't know if they have. I'm not aware if they have. They may have the other um, uh, people inside the department. I'm happy Is to the U.S. pressing them for this information to be able to conduct your own sort of assessment, whether U.S. weapons were involved, for example? We are, we are pressing them for a full, transparent investigation. Obviously, as part of that, trans, uh, that investigation, it would include the unit. I don't think this is information that would be ultimately difficult to come by. Um, and without... Um, saying what we will or won't do, obviously whenever there are any type of um, incidents such as this, it is the type of thing that we conduct our own assessments when it comes to um, uh, 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 fulfilling our own obligations under U.S. law. Is there any sense that it could be anything but a U.S. weapon given the number of weapons that are given to the IDF? I, I don't think I can say one way or the other when there's an ongoing investigation. Yeah, go ahead. Good Ukraine, unless there's a middle, middle East. Yeah. Um, this morning, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield um, described President Zelensky's victory plan. First, she confirmed that the U.S. has seen it, and she said it lays out a strategy and a plan that can work. I just want to confirm first that Maine State Department has also seen the plan and shares this view. Uh, we were briefed uh, on elements of the plan when we were uh, in Kyiv last week, and yes, we uh, uh, share the um, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield's assessment. Um, as President Zelensky has said, he looks forward to presenting that plan uh, in detail to the President uh, in the coming days and weeks, and I think we'll you know, await, that, uh, await that meeting before offering any kind of further conclusions about it. Is there a timeline associated with the implementation of the plan? You know, I think I ought to let Pre President Zelensky, uh, whose plan ultimately this is, um, speak to the details of it. Okay. And on the question of um, Ukraine's use of long-range American-provided missiles in Russia, um, Secretary and Foreign Secretary Lamy said that discussions would continue during the UN General Assembly next week. Um, first, I want to confirm you have no policy announcements to make today Correct. regarding that. Um, so if indeed this decision hasn't been made and hasn't been made tacitly, um, is it the U.S. view that the Ukrainians don't need this capability urgently enough that it merits additional weeks of discussion? I don't think you should draw any conclusions about us conducting the type of deliberate process that we have always conducted when it comes to providing Ukraine the uh, tactical assistance they need, uh, providing them the capabilities that they need to win this war. Um, the secretary spoke to this, and well, you were on the trip, you know. You don't want to hear me repeat what he said about how we have to be oh, deliberate and, uh, uh, and careful and ultimately make sure that with everything that we provide them, there's uh, a strategic rationale for doing so, and so we're con we continue to engage in that process with them. Absolutely, but you and the Secretary have described this as a critical point for the Ukrainians, a you know, pivotal point on the battlefield as well. So there's no concern about the length of this deliberative process regarding this one policy. No. As you've heard the Secretary of Defense say, there is no one capability that ultimately by itself is the uh, magic wand uh, that, is that is decisive in this conflict. There are a number of different cap capabilities that taken together uh, can help Ukraine this uh, win this war, and that's what we continue to provide them, and we will continue to uh, assess whether there are additional capabilities, additional um, uh, tactics, additional techniques that we ought to provide to them, and uh, when we assess that uh, it is in uh, their interest and in the interest of the United States to do so, we'll do, we'll do so. And just one additional point of attempted clarification. Is it the U.S. position that other Western countries who have provided long-range weapons to Ukraine should wait for consensus before they green light the use of their own weapons by the Ukrainians? The, so those are conversations that we have privately, and I think I'll keep those conversations uh, in private diplomatic channels. Alex. Let me follow up on this question. The announcement and decision. So you don't have announcement to make, but that doesn't mean that there is no decision. I just don't have any announcements about change in policy. But have you guys turned down Ukraine's request? On I don't have any further. I don't have anything further to say. These are things that, excuse me, that we discussed directly with our Ukrainian counterparts, and we'll continue to do so. But the secretary said in Kiev, and also you repeated yesterday that you guys want Ukraine to win. How do you expect them to win with one hand tied behind? We, we expect them to win by continuing to provide them the billions of dollars in security assistance that we have provided them since the outset of this conflict, the type of security assistance that along with brave Ukrainian fighting has led them to recapture um, a majority of the territory that they lost to Ukraine in the early days of the war. That the, the, oh, lost to Russia, excuse me, thank you, Matt. Uh, that they lost to Russia in the early days of, of the war, the capabilities that have led them to win the battles of Kyiv and Kharkiv and uh, Kherson uh, and have led them to push Russia back um, uh, 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 from the Black Sea. 
those are the types of policies that have shown success that we will continue to pursue. Thank you. We just discussed Iran uh, minutes ago. Uh, Russia's Shoigu happened to be in Iran today. Do you have any, any evidence that uh, the missiles that they have provided have been used on the battlefield? Uh, I, I don't have an assessment to offer of them having been deployed yet. Uh, obviously, as you've heard the secretary announce, we have seen them uh, uh, been, we have seen them be delivered to Iran. I do not yet have an assessment. Russia, oh, Russia man, I'm all over the place. So, to Russia, um, uh, I do not yet have an assessment of them having been used on the battlefield. And I also want to follow up on what you just told my colleagues about Iran's uh, you know, capabilities, nuclear capabilities. They are. We have seen reports that some of them are very compelling, suggesting that. Iran might have nuclear capabilities before the end of this administration. If that's true, uh, why should we trust any word coming out of Iranian president's mouth? Uh, so, so give me a break with it if that's true. It's not, so you're going to take a, uh, a report that has not been verified and say if that's true? It continues to be our policy that Iran will not get a nuclear weapon, uh, and we are committed to that. Thank you. I have one more on Georgia, if I may. Uh, it uh, looks let me like go. Georgia. Only because we're short. Let me go. Thank you. Um, U.S. has imposed sanctions uh, on the Chinese Research Institute and several companies involved in supplying Pakistan ballistic uh, missile program. And this is not the first time such sanctions have been imposed. What are the real reasons and concerns? So the United States is committed to strengthening the international non-proliferation uh, regime by taking action against networks supporting uh, activities of proliferation concern. We have been clear and consistent about our concerns with Pakistan's ballistic missile program for uh, many years. Uh, the executive order action that was taken last week follows our October 2023 and April April 2024 designation of six PRC entities and one Belarusian entity that have worked to supply Pakistan's missile program as well as the listing of numerous Pakistani and third country entities on the Department of Commerce entity list for decades. So you call Pakistan a partner, a partner uh, fought uh, with the United States in war against terrorism, sacrificed more than 80,000 lives and infra infrastructure uh, worth billions of dollars. Uh, and still paying a price after they pull out of American forces from Afghanistan. Um, and in return, it gets uh, sanctions uh, on its ballistic missile program, which is very essential uh, for its defense capabilities. And these are the thoughts of the foreign ministry when I spoke with them this morning. Yeah. And they also said that Pakistan considers this action biased and politically motivated. What is your thought on that? So Pakistan has been a long-term partner of ours, and I think what this action shows is that there continue to be places where we have disagreement, and when we have disagreements, we won't hesitate to act on those uh, uh, to protect America's interests. Uh, it has been our long-standing policy to deny support to Pakistan's long-range ballistic missile program, and we will continue to use uh, our sanctions and other our other tools to ensure our national security uh, cannot be uh, uh, cannot be impacted and that the U.S. financial uh, system cannot be used by proliferators. Go ahead. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, what's the Secretary's reaction to the House Foreign Affairs Committee doing a markup of a resolution to hold him in contempt of Congress for not complying with the subpoena to appear before the committee related to its report about the withdrawal from Afghanistan? So we continue to not understand um, uh, why the committee has chosen to take this step. Um, as I said in response to a question from Matt yesterday, the Secretary has testified 14 times before Congress on Afghanistan. Four of those times have been before this committee, including um, one uh, appearance that was exclusively focused on Afghanistan, that was the sole subject of the hearing. We cooperated with their investigation uh, into the uh, Afghanistan, provided them with documents, provided them with witness interviews, and we have tried to accommodate their request for a hearing. Uh, they asked for a hearing um, this Thursday. Obviously, the secretary is traveling, trying to advance a ceasefire. He's not able to be there um, because he's uh, 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 doing important, the important business of the United States. But we've said we would make the deputy secretary available, and we have offered the secretary to appear at a later date. And so we wish later date. Uh, we, these are negotiations that we have with the committee. But we've offered a later date when he's not traveling overseas, conducting important foreign policy uh, interests of the United States, or otherwise engaged in um, these critical meetings that he has to do on behalf of the country. We have offered his testimony, and if they are fix, fixated on this date, we have offered the testimony of uh, the deputy secretary, and wish, we wish that they would take yes for an answer rather than moving to this extraordinarily unnecessary and unproductive step. But he will show up for a hearing. You're, you guys are not fighting the subpoena in court. They have, um, uh, we are not at that point yet. They have moved to, uh, moved directly to contempt uh, when we were what we thought, we were in what we thought was the middle of the type of negotiation process that 
the Supreme Court has said Congress must carry out when it comes to uh, asking for testimony from executive branch officials. Um, they asked for his testimony. We told them that we would engage with them on a date. They sent a subpoena. We told them that he was traveling to work to try to secure a ceasefire on the date of their subpoena, but we would ha be happy to accommodate them in other ways. And they, for some reason, have moved to this extreme step. I can't explain it, um, but we will continue to make clear to them that we will accommodate their legitimate oversight interests to, um, to the extent we can. But when it comes to just picking one date and saying the secretary has to be here when he has for some time planned to travel overseas to try to advance the foreign policy interests of the United States, that is not the type of legitimate accommodation process that the, con that the Supreme Court has said the Constitution requires. And finally, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is directing the army to add 180,000 troops, bringing the total number to 1.5 million. This would make Russia's army the second largest worldwide, overtaking the U.S. Army, which is on, which is in third place uh, currently. How is the U.S. planning to respond to this move? Does this concern Western allies at all? Well, let me just say first, it's another sign of um, the desperate choices that Putin has had to make to sustain this war. Um, you've already seen it be an extraordinary drain on the Russian economy. Um, you've seen uh, uh, Russia pay an extraordinary cost in uh, deaths and casualties, hundreds of thousands of, of Russians who uh, have been killed or wounded in this conflict. And this action just shows that he is uh, continues to be committed to sacrifice the, the lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands of his fe fellow citizens for this needless war. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up on uh, Said's question on the school in the West Bank. Yeah. So, so earlier this year, you announced a, a policy of sanctioning Israeli settlers who commit violence against Palestinians. And since then, you've sanctioned several uh, settlers. But you have also uh, said that the establishment of settlements themselves in the West Bank is inconsistent uh, with international law. And since these settlements that house extremist settlers are considered to be illegal, why aren't any of these sanctions placed on the illegal settlements themselves? Why isn't there a policy of sanctioning illegal settlements? So you have seen us uh, sanction um, not just individuals, but uh, organizations who have been involved in violent conduct. And that continues to be our policy to uh, sanction those involved in violent conduct when we see the government of Israel not taking appropriate steps to hold them accountable. When it comes to the questions of settlements, yes, we have made very clear that we believe that they're um, uh, inconsistent with international law. And fundamentally, this is the, the something that we believe needs to be resolved through negotiations for two states, which we continue to, to push for. But if you consider them to be illegal and they are establishing more settlements as we speak, why not sanction the since they are illegal, I, I don't understand why. We have sanctioned people based on um, uh, violent conduct, which is the authorities that we have under, under United States law. Ultimately, we have a policy question about what the uh, ultimate way is to uh, achieve a resolution to the very difficult situation in the West Bank. And we believe the um, way to resolve this question ultimately is through the establishment of an independent Palestinian state, um, something that I know is extraordinarily difficult. It's why uh, as people have been working on it for decades, but that we will continue to pursue. The premise of the questions, completely legitimate questions, are that you believe that the settlements are illegal. That is not U.S. policy. As I said, we, as I said, we believe they're yeah, inconsistent. But you inconsistent. Not, yes, exactly. I, but you yeah, haven't incon corrected him. He said illegal numerous I, times, and you have answered, such as we believe that, you that you think that they are illegal quote unquote illegal, and that is not the U.S. position. So our position right? is, and I'll just say as a note that I oftentimes don't go around no, uh, I know, tangling with questions. I use my own words. And, and yes, we believe that they're inconsistent with international law. Gita, go ahead. Question on Turkey. Uh, Undersecretary John Bass met with his Turkish counterpart today in Turkey. I was wondering if you have a readout. I don't. I'm apo I apologize. I haven't talked to uh, uh, Undersecretary Bass or other officials on the trip. I'm happy to take it back and get you, get you a readout. A question on Mexico. The... Uh, the the, U, the Mexican government finally enacted this judicial reform that they, they had strong concerns from the U.S. ambassador there. Do you have any comment about this enactment? So obviously we um, uh, have noted the enactment. Um, uh, we especially look at the enactment of this law in light of our joint efforts to promote our economic competitiveness and integration. And ultimately, we will continue to have a dialogue with our Mexican colleagues uh, on the uh, statute and how it's implemented. 
Yeah, yeah. Go I mean, the investor said that it'll uh, affect the the in, in, investor confidence. I mean, does that still is that still the case? Is the U.S. still seeing a, a downward spiral, if you will, in Mexico because of these? Uh, uh, we stand by everything the ambassador said, and what we're going to do now is have a dialogue with uh, our Mexican colleagues about how this law is implemented. Julia. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, in Pakistan, for the first time, there is accountability of military generals going on. So we have, there is one general of the intelligence who is arrested um, for corruption. Uh, Pakistani people and journalists are very excited and are hoping that State Department uh, could release the asset details of the Pakistan military generals who have them. Uh, tons of them have properties here. Can you like make it official? I don't have any update on that, no. Okay, um, but do you, uh, is it in your notice that the same channels uh, to transfer the money for the money laundering that they use to bring it to America, it's the same channels the terrorists use to uh, transfer money to each other as well. And a Pakistani guy just recently has been arrested in Canada for doing a terrorist activity. Look, we're, going to, we're going to continue to enforce uh, all U.S. laws that, uh, as they relate to support for terrorism, but I don't have any comment on those specifics. Just the last one. Um, Today, Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, has another very interesting diplomatic thing going on. Um, I'm sure you're aware about their firing uh, with each other, soldiers. Today, the Afghan diplomat in Pakistan did not stand for the Pakistani national anthem because he said that there was music with the national anthem. Uh, do you have about these jokes going on in diplomacy in that part of the region or no? No, I, I, I just don't have any comment on that. That's not a, uh, not a matter for the United States. Go ahead, and then we'll wrap there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, go on, Georgia. In response to the sanctions, the Prime Minister of Georgia stated that this was not the decision of the State Department, but it was made by some other groups. And just now, a statement was released from the Prime Minister's administration indicating uh, that, and I'm quoting, with this decision, the American side has drawn closer to critical limits. What is your uh, response closer to Closer to who? To, to limits. To limits. Um, I'm not going to deal with that. I will say uh, in the United States, unlike some countries in the world, it is the democratically elected government that makes our uh, uh, policy choices and no one else. And with that, I will wrap for today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt.